Kia ora everyone and a very warm welcome to Surfside Online, the place to go for the messages of Surfside Church and a happy Father's Day to the dads of our house and community and to dads around the world watching this, we hope that you are so blessed this week as we celebrate in a very special Sunday service. We pray that as you watch today's message, you encounter Jesus, are inspired to be part of his people and go on to live a life full of God-given purpose. Kia ora everyone, happy Father's Day and welcome to Surfside News. To all you dads out there, we hope that today has already been a very special day for you, that breakfast has gone down a treat and that the rest of our service is a real blessing for you. We have a few special things still to come in the service, so stay tuned for what's ahead. Up ahead this week, we have Life Group. Every Tuesday and Wednesday around Raglan, we love getting together in small groups to go over Sunday morning's message pray with and for one another and enjoy great food and great company. If you've never been to a life group before and would like to, then catch up with Pastor Norris Peart or one of our life group leaders. This week is also Ignite Youth Leadership Week. For the young people of our church, it's all about developing as future leaders. Head on over to the Surfside office Thursday night with Brendan and Esther Rickard. Well, that's it for this week. Enjoy the rest of the service, and once again, a very happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. See you next time, and back to you, Pastor. Yes, Father, we do thank you for the fathers in our lives, and and the Father figures in our lives as well. But Lord, ultimately, we just want to thank you for, for being our, our heavenly Father. And so, Lord, as we open your word now, and um, Lord, we want to hear from, from you, our dad. And we want to we wanna just keep growing in you. We want to um, become all that you want us to be. And so I just pray that this time will be a real connection with us, um, with you, and Lord, that you will speak to us. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 <coughs> the kids told us what their dads mean to them, teach them how to ride a cow. They spend time with us, they play soccer, they do, do music. Uh, they say, do it once and do it right. And they say, don't be lazy, don't they? Dads, my dad always says thank you and likes to go on holiday and play Lego and uh, makes us breakfast and works hard. Then there's a f probably a whole lot of other things that uh, dads mean to all of us. <clears throat> that statement up there, as I mentioned, the wise man builds his house upon the rock is our theme for Father's Day, foundations. And I guess the question is, what foundations are we building our lives on, and what foundations are we building our families on? And uh, that, so that's our key verse today. <clears throat> it's also part of a parable that Jesus told about the wise and the foolish builders, and it's a pretty well-known one, and um, I think we've probably, most of us, heard it growing up if we were blessed enough to go to Sunday school and so on. And uh, <clears throat> it's quite natural, really, that Jesus told a story about builders because Jesus was a carpenter. He was a builder by trade. And so it was only natural that he would tell a story about building to illustrate a truth. And that's what this is. Now, I've got, uh, as we read this story, I've got a couple of props here today just to help us. I've got a, I've got a rock. <clears throat> Pretty good solid rock, and I've got a bit of sand here. <clears throat> so let's um, let's read this parable that Jesus told from Matthew seven verses twenty four to twenty seven. This is uh, Jesus was speaking to the crowds. He was speaking to people uh, from all walks of life. Most of them just uh, 
ordinary men and women like us that had kids and families and work responsibilities and just had to live life. And Jesus was speaking into the everyday person's life. So we can relate to this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and speaks and, and puts them into practice is like a wise man. See, there's the comparison. There's the analogy that Jesus is bringing uh, between the building and a wise man, the practical thing, the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. <clears throat> I think here, Jesus is acknowledging that from time to time, as we go through life, we will go through storms. Is there anybody here that's never had a storm or a hard time or a tragedy that they've had to deal with? We all do, don't we? We all go through storms. We all go through challenges. And uh, that's what Jesus is acknowledging here. But he's also making, helping us to understand that we don't need to allow these storms, these floods, these uh, gales of wind, these things that come from unexpectedly and hit us from left field, they do not need to overwhelm us, regardless of what they might be. In verse 25, the rain came down, the, st the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great, rock, a great crash. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I've got a rock here today. Now, that's a good, solid lump of basalt rock. Um, and I, I guess I was quite inspired by Harry's message last week. How many of you were here last week when Harry Slade, he, he had some good props up here, didn't he? He had... Uh, you know, a sponge, and he had some mayonnaise, and he had some water. And I was thinking, hey, that was so cool, and it was such a great message, wasn't it, about processing pain and how we need to do that in a healthy way. And, and so I thought, well, I'm going to have some props today. So there's my rock. And I could have, of course, I could have brought in a huge, much bigger rock. Um, but, you know, they're quite heavy, and I was worried about the table. <laughs> I did have a bigger rock lined up, but I thought, well, that's actually quite a good solid little rock and it's only one piece it's just simple and then all the sand here um, you know there's thousands and thousands of grains it's probably millions of grains of sand in that container there it's incredible isn't it how very similar material and yet such a different um, texture to it and a different outcome <coughs> so this rock here it's solid it's heavy and the sand with thousands of, in it, of pieces can just get blown away in the wind. But even this rock here, it's not going to get blown around in the wind. It's going to take a, a big flood even to shift it. <clears throat> but I guess um, what we need to think about, what's our life more like? Is, it more like, is our, our life more like a rock, which is sort of simple, really? It's just one thing. It's not a whole lot of things. It's solid. It's um, <clears throat> consistent. It's immovable. Or is our life more like a grain of sand that's actually quite complicated with lots of little parts and lots of ideas and theories and, and uh, you know, things that can get changed and shifted and you know, if you have a, have a, a, good, stand, a good storm, the whole lot will just disappear. <clears throat> so what's our life more like? Do we get blown this way and, and that like the, the sand, or our, is our life firm like a rock? What about our family life? I guess because it's Father's Day, we're thinking about family life. And when I think about growing up, few years ago now, and in my parents' day and my grandparents' day, really, I think life used to be a whole lot more simple like this rock here. And there was usually just uh, mum and dad and the kids, and that was the family. But these days, <clears throat> life 
and family life, families can be apparently whatever we choose to make it and uh, can be much more complicated. And, and I understand that a woman can even choose to have a family without a man and just by simply having an, an anonymous donor. And so the woman and the child would grow up without any father figure in the family and wouldn't necessarily ever know who the natural dad was. So it's just quite complicated today, isn't it? Families can be all sorts of things compared to uh, a much simpler in our day. <clears throat> and I think the reality is that our culture, the society that we're a part of, is struggling right now to keep things together. There's a struggle going on uh, <clears throat> in the world that we live on. It's like as a society, as a culture, we've shifted from building our life on something simple, something solid, something durable, something consistent, onto something that can be whatever we want to make it, something quite fragile, really, that can just be shifted around. <clears throat> It's like we've built on the sand of all sorts of good ideas. And then when a storm comes, in the last couple of years, we've had a few storms with COVID and all the rest of it. Things start to fall apart, don't they? You know, <clears throat> I recently, I'm just going to tell you a couple of stories. I recently had a small panel beating job that needed to get done on my car. <clears throat> it wasn't a big job and... Uh, you know, we organised it back, I think, in January, February this year, and the insurance was all sorted and was all ready to go, and the, the guy had the parts, and then I ring him up, he says, oh, look, I'm just too busy, I'm snowed under, can you leave it a while? And so I ring him back a month or two later, he said, oh, yeah, well, I'm, you know, we're still busy. And then <clears throat> after a few phone calls, finally he said to me, look, I'm sorry, just bring it in, just bring your car in, we'll, we'll manage to fit it in, it's not a big job. And when I got there... <clears throat> He said to me, he said, Roger, look at all these cars. There's 20 stolen cars in my yard here and uh, that are all damaged because, you know, people have been stealing them. They run into things, they stop, then they steal another one or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> all these owners need these, their cars back. And so he said, last, this was only a few weeks ago, he said, last week in Hamilton, there were 40 cars stolen in one weekend. And he said, the insurance companies just keep dropping them off. He said, every panel beater in town is just inundated, stretched to the limit, trying to fix all these damaged, stolen cars. <clears throat> and then we've heard... We've all heard about the ram raids, haven't we? We've all heard about what's going on around the country. 13 and 14 year olds stealing cars and ram raiding shops. You know, even here in Raglan, we've had a few of these, haven't we, over the last few months. <clears throat> Two or three weeks ago, apparently there's an armed hold up in the BP just on the corner here. And Courtney's sister was held, you know, we know Courtney, she's part of our church on their money music team. Her sister was held up at gunpoint over a packet of cigarettes. And um, <clears throat> yesterday, I got a call to say that the vet clinic door had been smashed. And I thought, oh, wow, that's, we need to, uh, you know, someone needs to get that sorted out. A couple of weeks ago, we got another call to say that the copper spouting had been ripped off to Yuku Church. And this is the third time in the last few years, and there was just that... Um, you know, that high bit that hadn't been uh, ripped off, but no, some, they ripped it off. And then just a few months ago, actually, we had a, a water pump stolen from the church that uh, was been sitting there for years, and suddenly someone decided they wanted it, and we went down there, no water, and it had gone. <clears throat> now, in some cases, we're told that there's kids of 9 and 10 that are out there at 2, 3 in the morning stealing cars and burgling shops. And I guess, you know, we can get angry about that, we can get mad about it, and we could say these kids just need a good boot and they need to, some punishment and all the rest of it, which is probably true. But the sad thing is that really I think we need to ask ourselves, where are the dads? 
Where are the dads of these kids that are running around at two, three, four in the morning, uh, stealing cars, breaking into shops, doing a lot of damage, and uh, actually ruining their future? They're jeopardizing their whole future, aren't they? And some of them ending up in gangs or whatever. <clears throat> but where are the fathers of these kids? You know, the very last verse in the Old Testament in Malachi you know, God says that he will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the children towards the fathers, or, that he will, or else he will strike the land with a curse. You know, as soon as we lose that strength of relationship between fathers and sons and daughters, then we start to, we start to live like we're living at, at our whole lives based on sand. And any storms, any problems, we just get knocked around and, and, and things just, it's like we're under a curse. That's so true, isn't it? So where are the fathers and where's that relationship <clears throat> that needs to be there these days? And I, it's not easy being a father in this culture. It's not easy being a parent in 2022, is it? A mum or a dad for that matter. There's so much pressure there's so many ideas and expectations on mums and dads right now. Parenting <clears throat> really can be like this big bowl of sand. So many theories and so many ideas and so many things that good parents we believe they need to do. <clears throat> and I just want to say this morning to every man in this room, those of you that are dads or granddads, and those of you that aren't yet, just take up the challenge of being a man, right? As you get up and as you grow up and as you take on that responsibility of married life, just take up the challenge. And I want to say to those of you that are dads already, you, <clears throat> you are doing a better job than you think. I just want to say to every man in this room that is a father or a grandfather, actually you are doing great. Far better than you realise. Keep it up. I mean, even simply being here today, you, it's like you're saying, well, I'm going to uh, base my life on the rock and I'm going to make a difference in, in my life and in the world in the days to come. <clears throat> so keep it up, guys. Now, just a few weeks ago, Norris lent me this book and it's called Crazy Busy. I don't know why he lent me that, but um, anyway, I enjoyed reading it. And it's got little chapters on every different area of our lives. And it's got a, a chapter there on parenting. And he talks about how parents these days get so stressed out. And sometimes parents think they've got to be there every moment of every day, keep an eye on their kids, and they're sort of like little helicopters, you know, uh, hovering around over their kids, not letting them do this, not letting them hurt themselves, they're not letting them eat the wrong things. And there's just a whole sense that the whole family life can revolve around one or two children. And parents get so stressed out, worrying about every little move their kids make. And there's just a couple of little quotes I want to read to you from this book. <coughs> one in... Uh, Page 67 doesn't mean much to you, but if you've ever read the book. The myth of the perfect parent. Parenting has become more complicated than it needs to be. It used to be, as far as I can tell, that Christian parents basically tried to feed their kids, clothe them, teach them about Jesus, and then keep them away from explosives. It's, pretty, it's fairly true, isn't it? Just the real basic things. Now our kids have to sleep on their backs. Oh, no, wait a minute. It might be their tummies or perhaps we're back on their backs. While listening to baby Mozart and surrounded by scenes of starry, starry night. They have to be in piano lessons before they're five and they can't leave the car seat until they're about five foot six. It's also involved. There are so many rules and expectations. Parenting may well be the last bastion of legalism, not just in the church but in our culture. 
We live in a per permissive society that won't count any sin against you as an adult. We can do what we like in this world today, unless you're a parent. But it, but it will count the calories in your kids' lunch boxes. And I keep hearing that kids aren't supposed to eat sugar anymore. What a world, what a world. And um, it <coughs> goes on talking about his own experiences as uh, growing up and so on. And um, in a little, another little story here, he, he talks in the, towards the end of this chapter about parenting. He said uh, <coughs> he's got a friend that he's quoting from. And this is what his friend said. When I was young, I had six theories and no kids. Now I have six kids and no theories. I must, the author says, I must be ahead of the curve. It took me only five kids to run out of theories, because he's got five kids. And I could be wrong, my kids are still young. Maybe this no theory is a theory of its own. I just know that the longer I parent, the more I want to focus on doing a few things really well. And I think that's the key, isn't it? We can be so busy with so many things, thinking we have to be this, that, and the other, and hovering around over our kids every step of the way and protecting them from every little thing. And actually, it's probably healthy for them to experience life and have a few falls and crashes along the way, and that's how we all learn. But, <clears throat> and not get, so just doing a few things really well and not get too worked up about everything else. I want to spend time with my kids. We all want to do that. And uh, teach them the Bible. Now, we're Christians. We, want to, we understand the Word of God is like a rock in our lives and in our kids, and we've got to teach them from the Word of God. Take them to church. We've got to be there as an example. Take them along with us. Don't just send them. Be there, dads and mums. <clears throat> Laugh with them. Cry with them. Discipline them when they disobey. Now, that's one of the old things, you know, in the old family life. We used, to, we used to know when we'd done something wrong and we'd get corrected accordingly. Uh, but actually, I'm grateful now. I wasn't at the time from parents that actually disciplined me. And uh, I, did get, I did go through a bit of pain at times, and I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> As parents, remember to say sorry when you mess up. I think that's a big one. You know, we all make mistakes, don't we? As parents, we're not perfect. And sometimes when we do make a, and I remember once or twice, I'm not going to tell you the stories because they're a bit embarrassing, but um, I've actually sat down with my kids and said, hey, look, sorry, I, I did something that was wrong there. I shouldn't have done that. It wasn't a very good example to you guys. And, uh, and I, I realised at the time that actually went quite a long way towards gaining respect from my kids because they realise, hey, Dad's uh, actually willing to own up and own stuff as well. And I think that's important. <clears throat> and pray a ton. And I want my kids to look back and think, I'm not sure what my parents were doing or if they even knew what they were doing. It doesn't actually matter. But I always knew my parents loved me and I knew they loved Jesus. Isn't that cool? And that basically, let's not get too complicated with our lives. And there's more I could read to you, but we'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> when, uh, when Cheryl and I were just beginning our parenting journey, as it were, in early married life, there, there used to be an, an old school idea. I'm sure it's not around these days. It was about ranking your priorities. You know, like you have uh, God first and then we'd have family second, and then we'd have church third, and then we'd have sort of work life, and then we'd have relaxation and holidays and entertainment, sort of. And so you'd rank your ideas, uh, your, your priorities rather, your, your values that you wanted to have as a family. <clears throat> and uh, we were pretty busy when our kids were little. We had a farm, a business to run. We had church responsibilities. I mean, at one stage, we were running youth group and home groups, and then we started pastoring here as well. And, and of course, with four small children, then you start ranking your priorities, and uh, actually, 
what you can end up doing is you end up pitting the good against the best or the best against the good, and actually you just get confused. What should I be doing today? And we quickly realized that this priority thing wasn't going to work for us. Instead of making the good the enemy of the best, or well, vice versa, we just did everything as much as possible as a family together. And so we would try to, uh, you know, like grow, growing up on the farm, <clears> their <throat> kids were growing up on the farm, and if I was going out on the farm, going to work, I would as much as possible take the kids with me. And um, I know that's not always practical in work situations these days, but there's, there's always things. I, I think we, as dads, we need to take every opportunity. If we're doing the lawns and trimming the hedge or we're working around the place or we're doing a veggie garden or we're out on the farm or on a building site, as long as it's safe, um, you know, we need to take our kids along and, and involve them in what we're doing. <coughs> and then... <coughs> Our kids basically grew up in church here. It's what we did as a family. They would help us setting up for church. They would help us packing down for church. They would help us running the church. They would help us with stuff during the week, getting ready for visitors that were coming and people that were coming and going and so on. And they got immersed in church life, whether they liked it or not. And I remember at <clears throat> one stage at, um, years ago now, we were going through a bit of a hard time at church and we were on holiday, I think we were over at Thames or somewhere, we were sitting around in a cafe with the kids and we were just having hot chocolates and coffees and relaxing and I said, oh look, I said to Cheryl, I'm just about uh, tired of running church, I think we should give it a break. And I remember <clears throat> one by, well, the kids all heard this. One by one, they're saying, Dad, you can't do that. And they were all in tears at the thought that we might not, as a family, be running church. It was just something that they had grown up with, and they, they'd loved it, and they loved God, and they loved being a part of what we were doing as a family. And, I mean, I wasn't really serious. I was just processing stuff as you do, and I'm an out loud processor. But they picked up on it, and it just made me realize we've got to be careful what we say, don't we? But also, <laughs> and sometimes our kids can uh, really sew back into us. And I thought, yeah, well, actually, you're right. We need to keep going with this. But anyway, <clears throat> so we had, a, we had a busy family life, and it really helped that Cheryl homeschooled as well. But in the process of what we were doing, our kids learnt the value of hard work on the farm. They learnt to work. They learnt to take responsibility. They learnt that actually you don't, there's no such thing as getting a free lunch. We have to contribute here. We're all part of the family. And they also, as I've indicated, they really loved church. And hopefully they also love God and love life. And uh, it wasn't as complicated as it needed to be. But <clears throat> we need to understand, I think, this is an old saying, the values are caught, not taught. Now, we can sit down and we can have deep and meaningful conversations with our kids, and now and then we need to do that. But really, if our life doesn't match up, it's probably not going to make a heck of a lot of difference. It's so, I think it's so much more powerful if we can just take our kids on the journey with us through life. So that's a bit of encouragement there. And I think you guys are doing this. And I just want to keep encouraging you to keep doing it and keep seeing the opportunities, keep bringing your kids along with you to church and keep leading your families because actually your families are looking for that leadership. And you certainly don't, like me, none of us want our kids out there on Friday, Saturday nights at three in the morning ramp, stealing cars and, and burgling shops, do we? And that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen to anyone in this room. And I believe that as we make a difference in our community and in our culture, we can actually put a, a healthy stop to all this sort of stuff that's going on <coughs> as well over time. But I also want to say about... And I've shared a few things about our family. We didn't get it all right. That's for sure. And there's still things that we're working on as a family. There's still things that we're praying through. There's still things that we're seeking God for. Um, 
And we're still, we're blessed to have 14 grandkids right now, but we're not taking it for granted that any of those are just going to get into heaven on the merits of anyone else in the family. They're going to have to make that choice from, for themselves. And so we're really praying for our kids and our grandkids still. It's not, it's not a given. We, we still need to keep working on things. <clears throat> I think the main thing is that you build your life, you build your family, you build your house on the rock. Which actually, in the end, is a pretty simple, straightforward way to live. Because the rock that Jesus was talking about, the rock that Jesus was talking about when he said the wise man builds his house upon the rock, he was talking about himself, wasn't he? He was talking about the word of God. He was talking about our heavenly father that loves us. But primarily he was in that parable, he was talking about himself, Jesus. Jesus is my rock. And I want to encourage you guys today. Is Jesus your rock? I believe he is. But if you're not sure, we need to be sure. We need to make sure that he is our rock. Because as storms come, and they will, God's word promises that we will still be okay. Because we have a firm foundation that our life is built on, and that's Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So how about if we stand where we are now? And I just, I just want to uh, give everybody in this room a fresh opportunity to renew their commitment to Jesus, or perhaps if you've never made one, to make it the first time for yourself. And it's not quite so practical today to get people to come to the front. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But I think just where we are this morning... If you want to make Jesus the rock of your life today, I just want to encourage you to put your hand, one hand on your heart and the other hand reaching up to heaven. And if you've already made that and you want to make a recommitment, we need to keep coming back to the fact that Jesus is my rock. Sometimes we get a little bit sandy in our life, don't we? We get a, a, we get a few things that come and go and a few different things that hit us and we can start to lose that sense of our foundations. So this morning, if you're wanting to make Jesus the rock of your life, if you want to reaffirm that commitment or make that commitment for the first time, whether you're a man or a woman or a young person here today, I just want to encourage you to lift your hand to God this morning. There's no better decision that you or I could ever make. Come on, guys, we should, we should all be lifting our hands to the Lord and saying, yes, I want to have Jesus as the rock of my life. And put your hand over your heart because it's, it's actually in our heart, it's in our life, it's in the center of our being that Jesus will come and he will be that central part in our spirit that we need to guide us through. And as we do that, I just want to pray a blessing and let's, let's pray this together. Just pray a few words. Dear Jesus, I want to make you the rock of my life. Right now, I look to you. I believe in you. I trust you as my Lord and my Savior for the rest of my life. Thank you for taking my sin and cleansing me from within and causing me to live victoriously for you. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, look, it's not a formula. It's not about uh, the right steps. It's a heart thing. It's about having Jesus in the center of our life, believing and trusting in him. It's so simple. It's like that rock. It's so simple. And yet it gives us a foundation of strength to get us through every storm that might come against us. So I just want to pray a blessing. Lord God, I just pray for a blessing over your people this morning, each and every one of us 
that have prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd come powerfully and touch and fill and encourage and embrace your people this morning. I pray for every dad, every father here today. Lord God, I pray that you would strengthen us as fathers, as father figures in our family and in this community. Lord God, I pray that we'd see a turning and a shift back into strong families that would really pour out a blessing. You'd pour out a blessing rather than a curse on our nation in this season. So we thank you, Lord God, for the good things that you're wanting to do in the days to come. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope the message has encouraged and inspired you. If you have any questions about today's message or would like to find out more about Surfside, then please get in touch with us via phone, email, our website or social media. Details are at the bottom of your screen. But for now, have a fantastic Father's Day and we will see you 